Okay, so uh, hello, we hope you can hear us. Yes. Um, it's a big welcome from the AMI event team, which in this case consists of Elske Fuhrmans, who is a part of the AMI outreach team, and myself, Joke, and I'm part of the legacy team here at AMI. And we're absolutely happy to see so many of you joining from different uh, time zones uh, across the world. Um, and so welcome again to the second AMI talk of this year. Um, as you know, our talks are open to, to all and we try to offer a mixture of deep knowledge and stories of how Montessori is actually lived. So today we have two fascinating uh, speakers from the USA. We have Barbara Rogoff, a researcher whose work is cutting edge and combines psychology, anthropology, education, a lot more, and with her team's work focusing on Mexican communities. And from Mexico, we are joined by Carolina Cerezuela, who will be reporting on her Montessori work in a village in Huaca. <laughs> Sorry, I knew this one was going to be a tongue twister for me. Sorry. <laughs> um, we'll start with, with Barbara. Barbara Rogoff is a UCSE Foundation Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she investigates cultural variation in children's learning processes and how communities organize opportunities to learn in everyday life. With special interest in Mexican and indigenous heritage communities of the Americas. She's particularly interested in cultural aspects of collaboration, learning through observation, children's interest, and keen attention to ongoing events, roles of adults as guides or as instructors, and children's opportunities to participate in cultural activities or age specific child focused settings. Um, she has received a Distinguished Lifetime Contributions Award and many other awards. I'm sorry, Barbara, for not <laughs> listing them all uh, here. Um, but recently, you have uh, posted a three minute video that you and your team created that you uploaded to the US National Science Foundation, which was an excellent introduction to the work done. And some of you who've just joined today may have already watched it because we, we shared the information with you and perhaps you've already, you know, formulated some questions following watching that video. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the, the chat. We'll try to make a selection of questions after Barbara's presentation, which will take approximately 30 minutes. And then we have Barbara's talk 30 minutes and we have five, six minutes for question and answer. And then we'll go over to Carolina. So that's basically the program for today. So Barbara, please fire away. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice to be here with you. I'm not sure where here is in a situation like Zoom all over the world, but it's very nice to be together with you. Um, I'm planning to talk with you about some of the research I've done in indigenous communities of the Americas where I have in some communities where I've been working for many years. Um, and I think you'll find that there's some similarities with the Montessori approach and some differences. So I'd, I'd like to ask you to be thinking about what's similar and what's different. Many people, when I talk about the work, say, oh, is it like Montessori? And so I have some speculations myself about the differences and similarities, but I'm not so familiar with Montessori as you are. So um, that's just something to be thinking about. Um, I'm going to share screen, uh, if you give me just a moment. Should be working in a second. Are you able to see it? I yes. didn't see. Yes. yes. Okay. I saw somebody with a thumbs up. Thank you. 
So um, the, the way of learning that I'm going to be focusing on, we call learning by observing in to family and community endeavors. And um, I need to make sure I can advance it. There we go. So learning by observing and pitching into family and community endeavors. When we try, when I give my talk in Spanish or when I talk about this in Spanish, um, the translation for that is, is a term that is um, known in Mexico, in parts of Mexico as uh, being a comedido. And what I wanna be focusing on in the talk today is, is the role of community in all different ways of learning, whether it's learning by observing and pitching in, or the Montessori approach, or, or the way schools are organized, that often people think about learning and teaching as something that happens in individual heads or between two people. And I want to just draw attention to what I believe is an important aspect of any way of learning, which is what are the community arrangements? What are the community? How? What are the community values that support or constrain uh, the ways that people can learn? And being a comedido is, or a comedida, is a very important uh, cultural value that doesn't have an easy translation into English, which is kind of informative. Um, but the way I would describe it, based on conversations with lots of people from rural Mexico, especially around Guadalajara, is that being a comedido means that you alert, you're alert to what's going on around you and ready to help out without being asked. So all of those pieces are an important part of being a comedido. And in English, well, Pitching in is, is the best way we've found to describe it. But apparently in the United Kingdom, pitching in is not a term that's used. So it's an American English uh, version. But I, the pictures here give you an idea of what it looks like being a comedido, pitching in. And that's going to be the focus today, the community value of being a comedido. For some reason, my there. Okay, my slides go forward. Okay, here's an example of being a comedido from a mother that we interviewed uh, in Mexico near in in Guadalajara. Um, the mother says there are days when she comes home and says, "Mom, I'm going to help you do everything." This is a uh, an eight year old, I believe. Then she picks up the entire house voluntarily, or sometimes. When I'm not done cleaning the house, she tells me, mom, you've come home really tired. Let's start cleaning the house. And then she turns the radio on and tells me, you do one thing and I'll do something else. And I clean the kitchen and she picks up the rooms. So that may look familiar to some of you and it might be unfamiliar to many of you. And when I talk about this in the United States, a lot of the European American parents, especially those with lots of schooling say, wow, I can't imagine that. And we've done some research that examines how common it is to in, in several communities to be <clears throat> engaging like that. And what we found by interviewing moms about how, how their children get involved in helping at home is that indigenous heritage Mexican children, usually 74% of them would pitch in voluntarily under their own initiative. And zero of the kids we're calling cosmopolitan, which are Guadalajara children whose families have a lot of schooling and have lived in the city for, for generations. What, that's the red one, the red bars. What they're more likely to be doing is uh, responding when their parents give them rewards contingent on their performing the chores. Or, and there's often struggle and negotiation. And there's often punishment. So it's, it's, it's not a peaceful scene in many of the homes of the kids 
<clears throat> excuse me, whose families uh, have a lot of Western schooling. Excuse me. I want to show you what that looks like in, in a uh, research situation that we set up. Um, we, we had a research assistant who visited children's homes. They were homes of Mexican immigrant families and European heritage families in the United States. And we asked for sibling pairs to be, we invited them to take part in a little science demonstration that they were going to make solar prints. You can see that little blue image is, is what a solar print looks like. And the research assistant during this demonstration, she occasionally does something without no, calling any attention to it that the children could help on if they were paying attention and wanting to help. And so she, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm going to show you a little uh, incident in which she um, pretends accidentally to knock over one of the containers that contains the little pieces of things that the kids need to make the solar prints. And then we watch to see whether the children help. And there's 15 occasions like that, different things that happen during the event, but she doesn't call any attention to it. She does not ask for their help. She doesn't even pause and look at them. So they're, they, if they're alert and ready to help, they, they can do that. If not, it, 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 there's no invitation for them helping. So let me show you this clip of a, a European American in a European American home of um, that piece of the the event. Because if I had it Friday, maybe over the weekend, it might fall out of my backpack and I didn't know, but if it was on Monday, the next day. So hopefully you could see that um, they were having a conversation and the boy on the right, uh, he glanced down momentarily, but he didn't. He didn't uh, stop what he was doing or or join in as she put the pieces back into the container. And his uh, younger brother over there wasn't paying much attention and and didn't help out. Now I'll show you a family, uh, some a pair of siblings from a Mexican immigrant home. In also in the California area. And I could jumped over the fence or something, and we heard a scratch outside. And when we went and go, when I went and go check, it was him. You know, oh was, yeah, they brought him over. Yeah. <laughs> no, he came by himself. So hopefully you could see that he didn't interrupt what he was saying. He was telling a story about something, and at the same time, he very skillfully rearranged so he could reach and help put the the objects back in the in the container a very different approach and we think that that's related to the cultural value of of being alert to what's happening and and pitching in so here's here is the pattern in terms of how many kids acted in the way that, that i was just showing you for the uh, Mexican indigenous heritage kids, kids whose uh, parent, whose families uh, have limited schooling and come from small pueblos in Mexico, in Mexico, um, they were more likely to be helping overall, and especially when it involved something that was helping the research assistant or the instructor um, with something that aided the whole project, not just their own project. So the difference was strongest in helping for the whole project. We also asked the moms of these children, how the, were the, what, did the children help at home? And how did they get involved in helping at home? And what we found was the Mexican children from indigenous heritage backgrounds were more likely to be, were very commonly helping under their own initiative. And very seldom did the mothers report that they used 
some kind of inducement or punishment to get the children to help. That was very different from the European heritage kids who very seldom helped with initiative and very often helped when somebody was paying them to help or nagging them to help or uh, punish them, punishing them if they didn't help. Very different uh, ways of, of being involved between those two cultural backgrounds. And again, we think that the cultural value of being a comedido helps connect with how these kids are acting in, in small moments of, of a sort of an everyday interaction. Um, and the same could be said for the European heritage kids, but it wouldn't be the cultural value of being a comedido, but the cultural value of paying attention to your own activity and, and that's it. So we also looked at children who came from cosmopolitan backgrounds in, uh, from Mexico, immigrants from Mexico to California from cosmopolitan backgrounds. And it was very interesting to see that the children from what we're calling Mexican kids from uh, extensive schooling families, they, in, the, in an instructional situation, they acted more like the European heritage kids from highly schooled families. But, but at home, the Mexican kids from cosmopolitan or highly schooled backgrounds, they helped out with initiative like the, kid, the Mexican heritage kids from indigenous heritage backgrounds. So it seems that the that children are adapting to the cultural values of the situations that they're in, not just the whole country or the whole city, but to the situation. So in an instructional situation, the kids whose families have experience in both cultural settings are likely to be acting like the European heritage kids with uh, whose families have a lot of schooling. But at home, they maintain the cultural value of being a comedido. And um, importantly, the kids who helped with initiative at home were more likely to help the instructor without being asked. So I think that we, it's fair to say that children everywhere want to help. I'm just going to show you this little clip from my grandson in my backyard, um, who's, he, he, he asked if he could use, they asked if they could use my um, lawnmower, I was mowing the lawn. Was that fun? Should we send a little video to your mom? Tell her what you're doing. So I'm going to do a little more on a mower. On a mower, but he did the edges. Okay, go for it now. So Solomon did that for 20 minutes, that, that sort of squeal. It's almost as if this was as much fun as riding on a roller coaster or going to some amusement park. The idea of being able to help out in the very early years, years seems to be widespread worldwide. So how do the how do children become so different in the way that they uh, pitch in to help at, um, at later ages? Well, we think that it has to do with different ways of, of organizing learning in the communities that they take part in. But I would like to just mention that I don't think this is built into people. I think it's based on our experience. And in particular, if you remember the, um, Mexican kids whose families have a lot of schooling, they adapted to the circumstances they were in 
whether it was instructional or at home. And it was easier for them if their families had experience in both of those settings, or it was more common for them, I should say. So I'm going to be going into talking about um, learning by observing and pitching in and uh, to family and community endeavors, which my team and I see as a, a whole system. It's multifaceted. It's, it's not just one little aspect of the way learning is organized. And I'd like to um, show you that little a video clip that got mentioned earlier. It's three minutes and it gives an overview of learning by observing and pitching in. And then I'd like to go into focus on a few aspects of it in the remaining time. So I'm going to, if this works, I'm going to uh, switch to the video, which I think I have to, yes, okay. All right, so hopefully this will work for you. An inspiring way of learning that is common in many Mexican and indigenous heritage communities has been brought to light by an international team of researchers. We call it learning by observing and pitching in to family and community endeavors. That is LOPI for short. The first year that I spent in a Mayan town in Guatemala, I was very impressed with the skill of young girls in the complex patterns and technologies of weaving when I asked their mothers, how do you teach your daughters to weave? They said, we don't teach them, they learn. I was very puzzled by this because my assumption was that people learn by being taught. So I've spent decades trying to understand how children can learn such complex technologies without being taught. My colleagues and I have developed a description of seven interrelated features of the process of learning by observing and pitching in to family and community endeavors. Of course, LOPI has been known in everyday life in many communities and in the wisdom of the elders long before our efforts. In our current understanding, the central feature of LOPI is that people of all ages are immersed in the range of activities of their communities. Their reason for participating is to be in harmony, getting things done together. Everyone contributes taking initiative to collaborate and foster the direction of the group. In LOPI, learning is understood to be a process of growth, a process of becoming responsible, community-minded contributors. To learn, people observe and pitch in within the ongoing activities of their community. And they're also guided by other people and by community expectations that everyone contributes. Communication in LOPI is based in the shared context, which supports talking and nonverbal conversation in the service of getting things done. In LOPI, evaluation occurs during the shared activities to support people's contributions, with feedback from the success and corrections of their contributions. Ethnographic and comparative research indicates that LOPI is a common approach in many Mexican and indigenous heritage communities throughout the Americas. LOPI is a strength for learning of whole communities, including the children, who learn as alert, community-minded contributors. Understanding LOPI can help us all learn to be community-minded. Como entrar al círculo de vamos a hacer esto todos juntos, eso que bien. So I'm uh, just needing to uh, find my other screen, just one second. Okay, there we are. I hope that gives you an overview, and I hope that you noticed, even though it was quick, that 
um, there are seven features that we regard as defining features of LOPI, learning by observing and pitching in to family and community endeavors. And one of them, and the one that I'm focusing on most today is the central feature, which is children are included in the range of activities of the community with many opportunities to observe and contribute. You saw a little video clip of, of uh, from a long time ago in, in the Mayan community where I've been working. Um, more recently, when I first started working there, here's a funeral situation where the children are present. They have an opportunity to learn by listening in. They can, un they can listen to people talking about the meaning of life, the philosophy, the cosmovision of the community and what happens after people die, all kinds of things by being present. And that is the central feature of, of LOPI, which as, as I mentioned, in, involves all ages being included in shared situated community endeavors. And they learn as they observe and contribute. Um, that's possible in, in situations where children are included. And I should mention that there's many variations within the same community over time, especially, and as people migrate and have different uh, experience in different cultural, cultural systems. So there's fewer opportunities to observe and pitch in in communities where children are segregated from the range of mature activities. And you may recognize this scene, even though it's New Mexico in 1914, none of us were there, um, or at least I assume none of us were there. In, in communities where children are segregated from the range of mature activities, such as highly schooled societies, school lessons and exercises are substituted for learning from actually being involved. And this began not that long ago, although none of us were there, a lot, not that long ago in the history of humankind, um, about a century ago in the United States, mass schooling and many immigrants to the United States, the idea of an assembly line was used very, very um, explicitly as the, um, as the metaphor, well, not the metaphor, the model of uh, how to handle all of this influx of children and the ways of just sort of, how do you manage all of that? So it's a bureaucratic system for, for instruction as children are removed from being a part of family life and, um, and um, other kinds of situations to be segregated into places like schools. And we've developed a, a diagram that also tries to describe that way of organizing learning, which is which we call assembly line instruction. And the central feature of that one answers the question, how does the community organize learning? Learnings, learners are segregated from the community and other ages to be instructed in bureaucratic situations, uh, bureaucratic in, in institutions. I should mention, and you all know this, that, that not all schooling involves assembly line instruction. And I've spent many years uh, as a parent volunteer and as a researcher in a school in um, Salt Lake City, which uh, which uses a model of instruction that is pretty much like learning by observing and pitching in. Um, and it involves collaborative guidance where the kids play a key role in determining how they study what they're studying. The kids develop projects that are purposeful and they have the opportunity to uh, observe and pitch in together to ongoing uh, conversations and projects. Um, I can't, okay, <laughs> I, now I see them. I have five minutes. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna very briefly mention a couple other of the facets of this prism, um, not all of them, but several others contribute important ways 
to being a comedido, to, the, to this paradigm for organizing learning. Uh, the second facet involves why do, why do people participate? And in being a comedido or in LOPI, they participate for togetherness, synchronizing in shared purpose, in community across generations. In order to be useful and appreciated and reflect well on the, on the collective and to get things done with initiative, responsibility, relationality, and harmony. I think you probably saw those features in some of the things I showed you already. That contrasts with how, why people participate in assembly line instruction. For the learners, they participate because it's required and to seek extrinsic rewards and avoid threats. Now that would be in the classroom, but it would also be in children helping at home in highly schooled families in um, European American communities, but also cosmopolitan communities in uh, Guadalajara. Um, allowances for parents or punishment, not you can't watch TV. All of those are reasons to participate in assembly line instruction and very different from the reasons to participate in learning by observing and uh, pitching in to family and com community endeavors. The third facet involves how people interact. And I, what I wanna emphasize here is it's through collaboration in LOPI. People collaborate flexibly with initiative. They coordinate fluidly as an ensemble integrating their goals, ideas, and actions. Everyone contributes in sync, in synchrony with the shared direction and pace of the group. Now, this feature here is, I think, where it may be a little different in Montessori schooling. I, this is just a guess, and I'm not gonna go into that, but food for thought. That feature is really different from how people interact in assembly line instruction, which I think is also different from Montessori instruction. In assembly line instruction, the expert controls the pace and the learner's motivation, their attention and their actions. And the expert does not join in the endeavor, but they divide and direct the work. And the learner's job, the learner's role is just to do what they're told. So, I want to, um, I think, conclude with a, an image of that third facet of collaboration. And um, I think I'll do it in this image. So these are Mexican heritage siblings who've been asked to create a path through this model grocery store and comparing them with European heritage, California children from highly schooled families. What I'd like you to see is how collaborative the, uh, these Mexican heritage sibling pairs are compared with the European heritage highly schooled pair. And here's the other pin. So it was much more, it was twice as common for the Mexican heritage kids to be collaborating and twice as common for the European heritage kids, middle-class kids to be dividing up the task. And they did that in several ways. One was, as you saw, to just push the other kid out of the way. 
Another was by taking turns in which they're really not thinking together. And another one was for one of them to be the boss and the other one to simply carry out, uh, carry out the orders. So I'm just going to um, <laughs> skip to my last slide in the interest of time. Um, there are these two ways of learning that I've been describing are only two ways. There's others, and I think Montessori is a, an, another way, but has a lot of overlap. That's my, that's my speculation. But all of these ways involve community values and cultural practices, in addition to the actions and decisions of individuals, and both the communities and the individuals develop and change over generations in communities. And I just want to, to end with those images of Dr. Montessori in several, in several situations to sort of think about the historical, the community basis of her work, as well as the interactions of the of children growing up in communities where being a convivido is a cultural value, or children growing up in communities where the ways of schooling, bureaucratic approaches to controlling children's behavior are, are commonplace. And I'll uh, stop with that. And um, I'll stop sharing screen. And thank you very much for your attention to what I've been trying to describe. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Roba Barbara. That was great. I'm sure a lot of it resonated with uh, the participants who joined us uh, today, indeed from you know all over the world. Um, Elska, do we have any questions in the chat that we would like to relate to Dr. Robo? Um, not so far, but if anyone has a question, please put them in the chat. We can still, uh, we still have time for one or two questions. I could provoke a question by saying, I think that what I've been describing as Lopi is common in many communities, indigenous heritage communities, especially of North, Central and South America. I don't know if it's common in other places around the world. I think some places, but in many others, no. So we've got people from all over the world. What do you think? Exactly. We have one question from me. Okay. Um, how does this relate to concentration and flow state? Is the question. Really oh. interesting question. I think that one of the things that people have noticed in videotapes that I've shown over the years is that the moms in the Mayan community seem to be calm focused broadly on what's going on around them, quick to collaborate with the kids and calm, compared with the middle-class European heritage moms who come across as somewhat frenetic. Um, I think that relates to the question that, that if you're trying to control everything, it's, it's kind of scattering. But if you're sort of focused broadly, at, Somehow, I think that that concentration and flow state. I think they're connected. We haven't. Well, we do have one study that relates to that. But I'll see. I think there's another question there. I don't know. If there's another question coming. Yeah. And also, yeah. This one. How yeah. do you pr promote uh, adherence to the program? Is a question. Um, this is not a program. Um, no. It is my research on how people do things in their everyday life, whether in schools or in homes. I, I am an observer rather than uh, intervening. However, I could say that in the school in Salt Lake City, which we've written about in a, in a book called Learning Together, Children and Adults in a School Community, in that school, uh, it's a public school and the families choose that school themselves as sort of a magnet school, although it's not called a magnet school. And the, um, the children are there 
and they love being there. So it's, it's not, I, I think the question was uh, adherence to the program. If the families have chosen it, the children, their parents probably chose the program, but the children are involved in choosing the, the curriculum. So for instance, they noticed that the birds in the neighborhood of the school didn't have as many places to roost because the trees were being cut down. So they decided they wanted to make uh, bird houses. This was first and second graders, uh, ages seven, six and seven. And so they wrote a grant to get the materials. They used it in the math curriculum, but the kids were the kids were making bird houses for the birds, and they were concerned about the birds. So it's not a it's not really a question of of the kid they're they're there because they want to be and they're doing the things because they want to be. Yeah. So thank you for those for those questions. Yeah, we also have an answer for you when you ask what you know. Are there other communities in in, in the world? And we've got an answer um, saying yes, it was common in Trinidad, where my mom is from, and was standing in Nigeria in my home when growing up. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I hope that people around, uh, researchers around the world and people who are working around the world in schools and homes, keep their eyes open for the ways that their community organizes, organizes learning. Yeah, uh, we have, shall we do one more question? Um, Oscar? Yeah, wait, I think we can do one more and then we have to uh, yeah. continue. Any other questions you still have, you can always send uh, to us to info uh, at montessori-ami.org and then we can forward them uh, to either Barbara or Carolina. Um, so yeah, we, we, we will have uh, the opportunity to answer your questions, but we cannot answer all of them today. Today. No, so we do one more question um, for Barbara, and that is, have you ever tried the haves and the have nots work together? <laughs> that would be so interesting. No. We <laughs> okay. have, I think many people have experienced that in their everyday lives. Yeah. And there's, it's, it, it can cause some difficulties with the people who are pitching in. Well, I won't go into the details of it. Those of you who have experience know that there's the, it, it, the, the cultural systems can, can be a mismatch. And it, I think it contributes to some of the uh, social justice issues that we see in everyday life in the United States and I think worldwide. Okay. Thank you very much to all the people who've asked questions and put in comments. Thank you very much for all that. And um, so now we're going to move over to, to Carolina, uh, Carolina Cerezuela. And um, Carolina has a degree in psychology and a master's in international cooperation for development. And she says she's absolutely passionate about education and human ecological uh, development. So since about 12 years or so, she's been living in a small Zapotec indigenous community in the southern highlands of Oaxaca. And there she's really in, inspired by the community, the culture, the life skills, which resonate very well with her views on ecology and education, because I think she wanted to start an eco village, but she won't, she'll tell you more about that. Um, in 2013, she co-founded the Ananda Learning Center. That's a Montessori educational project, and that works very closely with the community. Um, she's currently promoting the creation of an adolescence community project. And at the same time, she's studying for the AMI 12 to 18 diploma with Guadalupe Corboya. And um, we really look forward to hearing more from you, uh, Carolina, on, on your work and your experiences. Over to hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that opportunity of sharing a little bit of our work and of, of our dream. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good, good evening. Uh, I know that we are here all over the world. 
Um, and I would like to say that my English is not native. I'm not fluent speaker, so I hope you can understand everything I want to share. Um, and I, I hope I can be clear. So I'm gonna to, I'm gonna share a screen and I'm because um words are just a part of what I want to share and I hope um through watching you can as well uh, absorb my, that I want to share with all of you. Um you can you can see the the everything. I don't know what why I cannot see you. Um everything is fine. You can see my screen. Yes. Yes. yes okay. Sir. Yeah, I don't I don't see you and probably it's for something. But anyway. Yes, so can... I am uh, 12 years ago I arrived here where the arrow points in the uh, southern highlands in Mexico. Um, it's a very high um, mountains. We are living in a 2,700 meters in a pine forest, very beautiful space. Um, and I arrived here uh, for three weeks. My idea was to be here for three weeks in an eco village that was just beginning. But I didn't know that I will stay here to live and to start a family. Uh, so I would like just to express that uh, most of us, we carry, we, we carry a big uh, belief system uh, through which we look the world and the reality. We, we look through our eyes, but these eyes are carry a big backpack full of, at, at least for me, full of preconceptions. Um, I grew up in a little village in Spain, um, that it was very clear that it forced me to be the same as most and punish me uh, for being different. So the life gave me the opportunity of traveling and studying, and that helps me to step out of my culture. And through that, I could discover more and more all this week I carried at least. So with this, I today I, I keep uh, working into myself. I, I see and I am aware of uh, these um, wounds that still here because when the wounds happens in these first steps of the life from zero to six, it's so they are so deep integrate um it's it's always are um, limited what we are in reality so i realize that i want to create a respect space for children are who they are in their differences and with all this in my mind is that I arrived to that point in Mexico, in Oaxaca, in the south of Mexico, and I met Kalindi there. Uh, Kalindi and I, uh, we, we decided to create a, an educational space for serving everyone, for respecting everyone in our differences and as well in cultural differences. Uh, we but we both of us came from different places different countries so we had a lot of questions about what met method we, we do we should choose because what happened what if we take methodologies from different places without taking into account the context we are and we need to understood which are the th aspects which are important for the people from this place, of this place. Um, and in, with all these, we were thinking how to adapt our knowledge to this environment and to the child and to these families, these needs. So we, at the end, we choose base all our work. At the beginning was a base, uh, uh, base in Montessori. Now this is been growing and growing, and we are being experienced 
many um yeah many challenge and we are being changing the way we are doing but we choose montessori at the beginning because we know that it adapts uh, to the children from respect and now we know that it's based in human tendencies with, that are universals and promotes uh, abstract knowledge through manipulation and that point was very important for the local people because here there is preconception everywhere no and here they had uh, learned or they had the thought that for one uh, school if if the school is good the children learn how to write read for six years old so we know that montessori is super good on that at the beginning um so we we choose that with all for all these aspects and with all these and i would like to say that um i love this concept permaculture permaculture means uh, everything into the place each place is unique and we need permaculture teach us to observe the place and adapt to to it to using through using local materials for building and this concept is also working, um, applies into um, production food. And for me, it's also uh, apply in education because uh, with all these, we wanted to create something here that it works here. Um, so we use building local building materials, mud and wood for the walls and grass to make the roof we assessment of local construction techniques which is a pre-hispanic technique zapotec construction technique and we work with the skills of the place we try to rescue ancestral uh, ways of construction and adapt it to our needs and it's so nice that uh, we work through human relationships and for us that is that creates the base of any project and for at least for all project these relationships with all the people who construct the people who uh, do everything in the whole is uh we, we value there as they are um we believe that we all are the same in different shapes so we start at the same time of building. Uh, we reproduce local materials, uh, local, um, sorry. We reproduce Montessori materials with a local carpenter, his Tonio, and he is still working with us as the others that appeared before. Everybody still is working with us because of this relationship base. Um, we work with volunteers and artisans and through all these we could materialize all our dream and that cost us a long lot of work every day little by little each week each each month with absolutely determination and constancy and you can see a little bit of pictures from the beginning we started in our house in my house and in kalindi's house um and at the at the same time we were building the main structure so but we 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 don't we didn't know many so we had a lot of guidance uh, from zero uh, how to work from zero to six but we didn't know much of how to work through after, uh, from six to twelve so what we didn't know we invented and I just want to put just that very simple example of how to cre we create many examples examples like this one where we create materials full of cards many many cards we spend a lot of time and money uh, to create many things that we have 
to redo. We, we did it we, uh, and took us a lot of time to discover the cosmic edu education vision and how to work spirituality uh, as in a transversal way. So for us it was so clear since, since the beginning to find the right persons to find the local to, to put we put a lot of effort into finding these local um, people who have the right skills and the right heart um, and we train that we find the resources we were working very hard for that and we still in that process to because for us to train local capacities was the key the real key and the most important aspect of of our work in a middle and long term and i would love to um, to introduce you to atalia she is an extraordinary human being who has been creating this dream with us for eight years she is the guide of three to six uh, classroom and she also co-directs the operation of the project today and during that time in these eight years she has been learning english by herself so i hope the video hello my name is atalia i am the guide of the children's home in ananda it made me really happy to work with children and when i started to work with montessori i discovered a new way to educate uh, with freedom, joy, and respect. And this way of teaching let me enjoy every moment. And these are some of the pictures of the result all of all this collective effort. The effort of many people who share a dream. This is the result of many people dreaming together. Ananda Learning Center is an example of environmental respect and cultural integration. We give, we have 50 children. Uh, we cannot, uh, we are working to be able to add some more, but our space is very little. We, uh, we are in the top of the mountain. Every, everything is very steep. So, uh, we have a very small spaces and we have a waiting list which is very is quite long and but the the, the project is we reserve this see five of the enrollment to local um, indigenous people and we are give scholarships to there and it's very interesting how we work uh, for being fair and because even here there is different realities and we try very um, we had a lot of effort to respect and adapt to each one reality so as well we want to be an example of how to take care of the uh, envir environmental uh, <laughs> of um, so we have a dry bathroom, compost bathroom, and we as well, we uh, take care of the water through uh, cleaning uh, the water with um, bio, the, not, not just bio the, the gestures, um through um, biofilters. And as well, looking at the community and understanding this erit um, indigenous heritage, uh, uh, we work through Tekio. Tekio, it means working together, uh, creating community through work, because we believe that work also unifies adults as they, it does uh, kids or adolescents. And we work to develop the mind and the conscience through materials, through presentation and experiments, and through this cosmic vision that is universal. Um, and we we really are working to create that as the center of all our work. 
um, we here because we look at outside and we realize the hard work of the community of this village, San Sebastián Rio Hondo, uh, we want to create an environment that represents that. And we want to value the reality of that place. And we try to contextualize, contextualize our work. So even if it's very little, we try to, um, children's here, tend chickens, gardens, uh, they weave or cook, uh, they use basic tools as, um, as a reflect of the society. And they do all, because this, this society, they do all these every day for life. So for us, children have to reflect a little bit uh, this reality into the classrooms. Uh, we want to, uh, in the adolescent stage that we are working now to create, we, our goal is to take all these skills to a higher level and to do it with more purpose and much, much more profound. So, to, it's like a tree. To create, the tree needs to create very deep and health roots to grow strong and healthy. And that's the cultural heritage as well. So we try we implement that through the regional and as well once per year um, in, in the winter, um, we do a temascal which is a pre-Hispanic Zapotec, um, uh, it's like a sauna, and we do that with the same ritual and symbols. Uh, it's, it change this uh, Temazcal, it changed in Mexico. Here we have a square Temazcal, and the stones are all the time inside. In, over, in the north of Mexico, that change are round, and the stones are in and out. Uh, in, with four doors. <laughs> so in this trying of contextualize more and more what we are doing, we are change a little bit and adapting some materials. Uh, for example, the washing clothes um, uh, area, uh, we are reproducing how they are doing here. The um, uh, we make us, there is a picture which is not real, but we're doing as well for real or, or bread, but tortillas are more important. And as well, we are taking us, they do for real. We processing grains by hand, corn grains and as well um, beans. And it's nice because we are a mixed community from different places of the world and uh, indigenous heritage community. So th the context, the local context is for everybody. We are here. So uh, foreigners, we adapt to uh, at least this is our uh, goal to adapt to, uh, uh, to, to here. Weave and sewing is also so important. Uh, and um, this local teaching know a lot, they have a lot of skills about how to do it. Um, but when we Im uh, invite par parents, um, elders from the community to teach, to teach us different techniques. We have a lot of examples of that. I, I had these pictures just as examples. But we, yes, we try to invite um, local uh, families and elders from uh, the place to teach us how to sew and weave uh, more and more and we share this knowledge uh, with the community. But that for us is so, so important. We have a story of colonization and a, and, and a deep and huge story of uh, natural devastation. So 60, 70 years ago, most of the local, of the native 
forest was destroyed. Um, they replanted for, with just pine trees, but the diversity was high, much, much higher uh, in all levels. And that's happened because uh, these um, people from outside are coming and decide what to do with the resources. So to have experience of relationships, interdependency and interrelationships and gratitude with nature in nature is part of our biggest and greatest goals. So we take time to walk, to observe, to 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 be ah to to have the curiosity and admiration of nature in nature. So we we observe nature, we draw it we make we, we we make meditations there we express gratitude uh, of course we try to from with others from the community learn from uh, medicinal plants local plants local trees we do reforestation a little bit of reforestation uh, of local with local native trees and uh, because we want just at that stage from three to 12, we want just to have them the experience of that. In the next level, in uh, this 12 to 18, we, our goal is to give that to another higher level and point. So in this, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, reading and many, many things inside. Uh, into the nature, with nature. And we think diversity is normal and is also necessary. Diver diversity makes us richer and wiser as human beings. And we are so proud that the children can experience that since they are child. So they can absorb that as normal. But we have a lot of troubles working with their parents because they are an adult already and it's so complicated to reverse these deep thoughts uh, because they grow up uh, with different absorbing different reality no? diversity is, is not normal because i didn't experience um, in my childhood so now our dream is bigger we are uh, now we want to create an community of adolescents that it with an office infrastructure that as well work a lot of ecological restore projects and our vision is that this center we will serve as a regional training center for many many hopefully all the teachers of the region and we, for us, uh, at least for me, I believe that it is imperative to bring the legacy of Maria Montessori to all the children in the world. Um, because I, I believe, and many of us, we believe that the develop of human conscience is the key for children to contribute as an adult rather than destroy. The conscience is that they make the difference. It makes the difference. Um, we believe as well that many people dreaming together the same dream that, that can create miracles. This belief is also in now in Montessori, Mexico, and it was before. And we, as, 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 um, in our project, a very small project, we are being having a lot of blessings or very high um, uh, educated people in, and that make the difference in our project. So we are now are part of uh, this dream that Montessori Mexico is dreaming to create Jorme. The, the, we want to create uh, through Montessori Mexico, with Montessori Mexico, a network of people who desire to promote social impact programs, Montessori philosophy. Um, this month, I want just to finish saying that this month was the 70th anniversary of 
Maria's Montessori death, and she left her greatest wish written down, which is it is I prayer to the dear children who can do everything to join me in building peace in people and in the world. And I believe that that can only happen if we, as an adults, do whatever it takes in all parts of the world to train the conscience of the adults and create the appropriate spaces to guide the child. So, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone that is here for being part of it. And thank you for trying to make that wish happen. <laughs> I want to go so quick. And it's thank so you clear. very much, uh, Karina. That was a, a, a great story that you shared. And we can see from the fact that there's many people who've been touched by the beauty of this uh, project. Um, we have one question, I think, at the moment, and that is, uh, how did your community and the children go on during the, the pandemic? Have you had to make any adaptations or did you continue? Yeah, we, it's fantastic being a very small village in the top of the mountain because here the pandemic we leave it very very different um we could observe uh, the cases that were arriving that it was very very few and we can observe it in real time so we it, it was a lot of trouble when we uh, cl uh, had to close the center because they have not access to internet they have no most of the ch or children have no computer so it was a lot of um yes it was a lot of complications but uh, at the same time most of the time we could be face by face working together working outside and that was that was amazing that was very a bless a big big bless yeah mm -hmm. Okay, then we have another question and that whether, you know, your program that you work, is it a dual language program, uh, you know, Spanish and Zapotec or not? We, we tried that at the beginning. So that's a very, very uh, interesting uh, question for me. Um, here in that village, uh, two generations ago, the Zapotec ends, but there is villages around that still Zapotec being alive. So uh, we have now, um, we, we are being working a little bit with Zapotec, but there, there is, this has been one of our main questions. And in this training center we want to create, we have that thought in the center because human beings can have four language at the same time. Can, we can absorb at least four language in that the, the right ages so the languages uh, in Zapotec or in in these different languages is where we really keep the way we look the culture uh, is is keeping through the languages so uh, we now are looking we are looking for how to work through that but not we could not do it here uh, at the at the level we wanted. Mm. Um, Thank you. There's one more. Oscar, you have one more question. Yeah, there's one more question, and I think then we have to um, close off. <laughs> um, the the question is: uh, Dr. Maria Montessori refers to play as the work of the child. In some cultures, work and play are seen as two separate entities. How do you explain to these parents the true meaning of play as perceived in the work of a child? Do you want to repeat the question or? Um, yeah, I think the, the main thing is like... Yeah, I, I think I understand. Yeah. Good, go I ahead. Understood. So we, uh, we, we work through respect the child as it is. 
So we, when we talk about Maria Montessori, we work about her principles, her philosophy. Um, they are doing very naturally in, of course, there is a lot of differences as well uh, in the way the children's, um, it, depending of the family, of the nuclear family, but they can absorb that as their own reality. And the, these principles are very, very universal and very ethics and humanistics. So it's we always talk about these principles. Yeah, I think that concludes the, the, the questions. Again, we just repeat the invitation to all of you if you come up with another question, just to sort of you know send it here to to info at montessori-army.org, and we'll make sure it either reaches Barbara or Carolina. But I think from the chat, it has become abundantly clear that both presentations were tremendously valued and um, found to be very in, in, inspiring. So thank you also for for leaving those comments for the for, for the speakers who've given so much of their, their time. And so we really appreciate it. We really thank you all for that. And we hope uh, we'll see you again online sometime later this year for the third edition of the AMI Talks. And uh, we're still working on the program, but you know, look out for our newsletters. Um, we'll keep you up to date. So thank you again, everybody, for, for joining. Thank you very much to both our wonderful presenters, Barbara and Carolina. And um, it's ciao from us here in Amsterdam for asking. Yeah, so you feel free to unmute and say bye to everyone. <laughs> <laughs>